Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers, I'm a day late and a dollar short with this update. I'm sorry, but I was ready to roll at 1215 this morning. My internet was not. It was kind of in and out. It was choppy, so I just didn't want to put that out. So here I am, cup of coffee in hand. After I do this, back to day 17. We got day 17 starting today. Yesterday was insane in that courtroom in a lot of ways. But first, we are going to do our song fact of the day. I love Woodstock. I need to show you guys like a tour of my studio. I have some Woodstock stuff here. But the farm where Woodstock was held was a working dairy farm. And so before the festival started, they kind of got the cows in one area to keep them away from the concert goers. But uh, people ran over the barrier, knocked down the fence. So essentially, they just decided to let the cows wander around and mix with the attendees of Woodstock. And one of the employees of the farm, his name is George Peavy, or probably was, it's been a long time, told the United Press International that the cow cows and the music fans seem to be getting along together just fine. Also, an interesting fact about Woodstock, financially, it was uh, not profitable in the beginning. They were in debt over $2 million for putting that on mainly because uh, they pre-sold 100,000 tickets, but once word got out, they couldn't do crowd control, so 300,000 people got in for free. All right, we're going to resume day 16, yesterday's testimony in the George Wagner trial. If you remember, his ex-wife, Tabitha, ended the day on the 15th on the stand. She was still on direct exam. That continued into yesterday morning. So they resume the testimony with her talking about the family dynamics at the Wagner house. And she said it was obviously really controlling and very strange. If Angela made a rule, you followed that rule. She said when she had her son and was in the hospital breastfeeding, Angela said since her son was still crying, he wasn't full and she needed to switch from nursing to formula. So there were some objections around this. I'm not sure why the defense would want to not make Angela look bad because it doesn't make George look bad. But there was a lot of objections and she said she wanted to continue and try to breastfeed. But ultimately he went on formula and I'm sure we know why uh, she knew about these family meetings that the Wagners would have. And they typically took place at the kitchen table. She said a lot of times towards the end, there was a lot of arguing going on. And every now and then, George would share with her what they talked about and decided, but not always. She said the Wagners also made a Facebook account for her that she had no knowledge of. She didn't know until family and friends told her. And it said she lived in Marion, Ohio. And Tabitha found it online. And she said everything on that page was inaccurate. She... It said that she was working at a motel, but she wasn't. She actually worked at Frederica's group home. There were a ton of objections during this as well. So they showed her a copy of this fake Facebook page. And on that list was mainly George's friends and family. Nobody in her family. She admitted she was unfaithful to George while working at the group home. And she was the one that admitted it to him. She said that she was pregnant with her son at the time and the restrictions on her life got much worse. She was fired from her job at the group home. George took her phone, factory reset it, and gave it to Angela. She couldn't answer the house phone, check the mail, or go outside by herself. She said every night Angela would tell her to go take a nap while Angela played with her son, Vine. That's his nickname, by the way, Vine. It's bovine, but they have nicknames for him and Sophia. So she talked to George about wanting to get her own place with him. Number one, just as a married mom with a kid, she wanted freedom in her life to make her own choices about how she ran her house. And she also thought that a move, just the two of them with their baby would help their relationship. But George said they worked on a farm and they needed to stay where they were in that house. She said that Jake and George were working um, before that house on Bethel Hill burned down. They were working at a car park factory, but they only kept the job a really short amount of time. 
She said they also had went to school for auto mechanics and George and Billy drove a truck for an asphalt company. That job lasted a couple of months at best. She said they also owned a semi truck and would haul cattle for money. Her and George got into an argument about her not cleaning the kitchen after Angela had made lunch. So Angela and Hannah Mae were leaving to go get toys for the kids. And Angela told Tabitha to clean up the kitchen. But during this time, her son woke up from a nap. And so she went to lay down with him to get him back to sleep. And by the time Angela and Hannah Mae got back, the kitchen wasn't clean. So her and Angela began arguing and she was trying to tell her why she didn't clean. She was really emotional, by the way, as she testified to this. You can tell these are pretty traumatic memories for her um, to recall. And hats off to her for agreeing to be test um, filmed because the cross exam got, oh, I, think, I think it went too far on Nash's part in some ways, although it was somewhat effective. I do admit that. So back to the not cleaning the kitchen. George was upset that Tabitha was yelling at Angela, so he slapped her. And then she said he started smacking her with a belt. She said this happened around the, son, the time that their son had turned one. And so she said her and George went into the bedroom and they were still arguing. So she was going to go sit on the porch for about 10 minutes just to calm down alone and she said George stood in front of the door with his arm kind of blocking her and wouldn't let her leave. So she admits that she bit him in the upper arm. And the only way I can say this nicely is she said she tried to rip his nuggets off. So he grabbed himself and moved his arm, and that's when she went out. As she was walking into the yard, George and Angela followed her, and Angela threw a two-by-four as she was walking out the door to go outside. And she told them that she was leaving. So Angela said she was going inside to get a gun. George told Tabitha to stop screaming. And she said, me and my smart mouth screamed louder. So he hit her. And she told him, you just, decide, you just signed your divorce papers. Tabitha said she hid under George's truck. And Angela and George had flashlights out looking for her. They weren't calling her name or anything. But they didn't find her, so after they went inside, she went to the shed and got her bike and drove down to the gas station, as we've heard before. So she said on the way to the gas station, as she was riding the bike, Jake and George pull up beside her and tell her to get in the truck and come back home. And she said she was not going back home if George kept hitting her. But when she got to the gas station, the clerk let her use her phone to call her mom and the cashier offered to call the police, but Tabitha said no. Then Billy, Angela, Jake, George, and Hannah Mae drove up and got out. She said she didn't know where the kids were at that time. She didn't see them. And they talked to the cop that was there and filed, George filed domestic violence charges against her. And they also said that she had dragged her son across the floor and was causing a mess at the house. So eventually her mom came and got her. She never returned to the Wagners after that, and she didn't press charges against George, which I understand that. When you're in an abusive relationship and there's a cycle, you have a fear of reporting because there could be retaliation, and little did she know this family definitely retaliates. So a couple of weeks later, George files for divorce. He had an attorney, and she didn't have a job or any money and really wasn't able to hire her own attorney. She did meet with his attorney once when he went to see her. They agreed that George would keep Vine, their son, until she could get a place. And her understanding of all this was that after she got a job and a place and established herself, they would go back and get it switched to 50-50 custody. Until then, she knew she was going to have supervised visits and they would agree on a time and place to exchange their son or when she could see see him but she said it's not how it went and according to her it was a almost a year after the divorce before she was allowed to see her son she kept trying to reach out to him and so she got a job and moved out on her own and at times they would make plans either he would say that they were busy that day or she would be on her way and he would call and say hey we're not home the kids asleep he would make tons of excuses so Tabitha's mom set her up with an attorney for a consultation. 
and he gave her advice on how to see her son. So she would call and text George and ask about seeing him. And then she would make notes of the dates when she tried to see him and whether or not it was successful. Her lawyer, however, didn't file anything in 2015. And I get that because you pay, you know, a consultation. They give you, you know, a little bit of free advice to help you out. But, you know, retainer fees and then that runs out. It's super expensive to get divorced and fight for custody. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars, especially if it's something that's contested. So her attorney that she consulted with gave her a little advice. And she wrote two letters to George. She put one directly in the mailbox and also sent one through the post office. And it was the state of Ohio's shared parenting plan that she sent to him. And she said, finally, it was around Christmas when she first saw her son for the first time in nearly a year. Her mom came with her. George did not know her mom was coming, and nobody was allowed to accompany her after that. In 2016, she said she saw her son maybe seven or eight times at George's house. And when she would visit, her son didn't recognize her as mom. And she wasn't allowed to tell Vine that she was his mom because George said his cousin, who is Sophia, was there also and had just lost her mother. So they didn't want to confuse Sophia. She made them aware that she was looking into court action to be able to see her son more often. And one time when she left the Wagner, she got pulled over and the cops said there was a call made that she was waving a gun around throwing trash out of her car, and she had drugs in her car. She said she gave the cop permission to search that car, but he didn't, and she said she's never used illegal drugs. Another time after she visited her son around Mother's Day or Easter in 2016, she took her daughter to the Wagner residence, who was around six months old at that time. She said the baby stayed on her hip until Angela asked to see her, and so she handed the baby over to Angela while she went to the restroom. Other than that, the baby wasn't out of her sight. But when Tabitha got home, her six-month-old daughter became kind of unresponsive, staring into space, and was limp. So she took her to the emergency room. They ran some tests and found that the baby had Xanax in her system. She said as far as she knew, nobody in her house was on Xanax, and she had been nowhere else that day. This kind of gets broken down in the defense cross. So a CPS investigation was initiated. Tabitha volunteered to be drug tested at the hospital that day, but she said it was a week later when they tested her and it was negative. At first, she didn't voice concerns to CPS that this seemed to have happened at the Wagner house, but eventually she did. So when the Wagners moved to Alaska, she said she found out a week or two after they moved and that a friend had told her they had seen where they had moved. She called George and wanted to know why he didn't tell her they were moving. And George said that Vine was his son and he needed to do what was best for for him. And she reminded George that violated the agreement. So the Wagners were gone to Alaska for about a year and she had no contact with her son. When she would try, George would say the kid was too busy or he was sleeping, just excuse after excuse. So The prosecution shows her that custody agreement that she signed, and she thought she would get to see her son in a way where she could pick him up, have time with him, and then drop drop him off. And she didn't realize supervised visits meant that she would kind of be at the mercy of the Wagners. And I can see how this can happen when you don't have an attorney guiding you and you've got George telling you what the deal is and you don't understand legal paperwork. I don't fault her for, for signing a bad deal, especially if she was promised that when she got on her feet, she would get 50, 50. I think she got kind of suckered into that. As she says, she said after Hannah Mae left the house, they did have contact if they ran into one another. And then they started messaging each other on Facebook messenger. And this was from her own Facebook that she created after she left. She never gave the Wagners her password to this particular account, which is the one that Angela ultimately saw. So they had conversations about living with the Wagners 
And there they read a series of these messages. We're going to go through them because I think it's important to before we get get into the cross exam to show you the girls point of view between themselves about the living conditions at the Wagner's. So there was a message from Hannah May to Tabitha, which was March 25th, 2015. This is just a little more than a year before the murders. And Hannah reaches out and says, I just want to say I'm sorry for being a B when you were down there and being rude. That's honestly not who I am. That's who I was told to be. But you can text me if you want, You have my if you have my number. So a few days later on the 28th, Tabitha says, so Cody said you and Jake are going through a custody thing. Hannah said, yes, trying to get a job. We're supposed to go to court over it. Tabitha said, you're the Tabitha said to Hannah, you're the mother. So it shouldn't be hard on your part, but we are dealing with Angela and you know how she gets when it comes to vine and they call Sophia suds, which is it's a cute little nickname suds. Uh, May 17th, 2015, Hannah May says, have you gotten to see Vine lately? Tabitha says, no, not yet. Every time I set a date to see him, George has something to do or somewhere to go. He tells me he'll message me when he gets home, but he never does. Hannah said, I would be really upset. I would say I'm scared to death. They're going to try and take Sophia. So you see a year before, this, I'm sorry, this was uh, May 28th, not March. Uh, I'm sorry, March 28th, 2015. And so you see at this point, we jump from March to May over. Uh, well, this is actually less than a year before the murders at this point. And she's already scared that the Wagners are going to take Sophia. Because remember, she watched Tabitha go through this. So Tabitha says that, you know, George says he'll message when he gets home. He never does. I'm sorry. Hannah says again, she, um, she's scared they're going to take Sophia. Tabitha says, it kills me, you know, since y'all weren't married, you automatically, he goes to, she goes to you automatically and he sees her every other weekend. But Hannah says, I know they could fight that. Tabitha says a judge isn't going to take her from you. You have a good home and people help you take care of her. Hannah May said, I know I'm trying to get me a place and a job as soon as possible. Tabitha says, going day by day, it seems you only get to see suds. I try to see Vine, but I don't have a ride on the weekends, and he works during the week and won't meet me anywhere, even though the paper says both parties have to agree. So Hannah Mae asks, what does your papers say? Tabitha says that we have to agree on a date and time to meet because it costs me $20 every time I go down there. If he would meet me somewhere, it would be easier, but George said no. The judge gave Vine to me, so George is saying the judge gave Vine to me, so it's his home, and it's where he's the most comfortable. And she said, but he's most fine going to other people's homes and everywhere else. It's just there seems to be that issue of meeting up with her. She said, he won't even meet me at McDonald's, and Hannah Mae said, I know. Tabitha says, every time I go, he has some reason. Vine just went to sleep, or you can only be five minutes because we're going somewhere. She said, the last time I was going to go down and stay a few hours, we made plans for me to come Saturday at noon so Vine wouldn't be napping. It was raining that day, and I told George me and my sister would be going inside, and he said my sister had to drop me off and leave and come back and get me when I was done. She doesn't have a phone for me to tell her when I was done, so he said, have her wait by Joe's gate. It's kind of off their property, just right on the road, I believe, from what I gather. Tabitha said she asked why her sister just couldn't sit in the driveway in her car. And he gives me this BS reason of if I was going to see Vine, I needed to be there because he was about to sleep. So we pulled out and called the law. And they said it's his land and we can't do anything. I said, what the heck is the law there for if he ain't going to do anything? What are they good for other than eating donuts and drinking coffee? And she kind of smiled as she said this because obviously there's cops in the courtroom. Hannah said, exactly, why is he that way? Tabitha said, because of what happened a long time ago, you probably heard us arguing about it with to me and my sisters a long time ago. It doesn't bother us, but it but he causes problems on it. Hannah said, I heard about it. That's what always gets brought up. 
Tabitha said it happened forever ago, but because we didn't say anything to anyone, the whole family was child molesters. And that's why he was going to make my sister leave and come back. We were little kids and didn't know anything was happening to us or that it was wrong. Does it bother us today? Yes. We wonder why it happened, but it doesn't change anything. I am who I am, and they are who they are. At this point, the feed cut off, but just a little backstory because this comes in a big, big way on cross-exam in a very inappropriate way, I might add. But the backstory, we'll get to it, but just so you understand this, Tabitha and her sister were molested by her mother's husband, who was their stepdad. Her mom was aware of the molestation and didn't report it because, you know, for whatever reason, I can't imagine. But um, so that essentially is the reason George did not want Vine over at her mom's house. And I get that. Okay, so I will say right now, I totally understand that. Don't have a problem with it because she admits not only were they uh, molested by a guy who still lived there, but the mom covered it up. So uh, Tapitha said, it worries me to this day and the visits need to be made between George and I, but he thinks it's his choice only. And he thinks he has full custody of Vine, but he doesn't. He's just the residential parent. Again, they bring out the custody documents and you see her perception of what she thought was the case with this custody arrangement was not the case at all. Hannah said, I never knew any of that crap about custody. It sucks. I'm scared for when I go because they have brains and money. I know, but it still worries me to death thinking I'll lose her. So we jump to July 15th, 2015. Hannah Mae said, I swim almost every day when I don't have Sophia. It takes my mind off so much. They told me not to talk to you because you hate my guts. Tabitha said, I didn't like you before, but only because you were doing what you thought was right. And if the tables were turned around, I would do the same thing you did to me. But no, I don't hate you. So you see how Angela kind of and everybody, I think the Wagners kept these girls at odds and maybe to a point to where they wouldn't co-conspire about the treatment they were getting at the Wagners and turn against them. There's strength in numbers. But if you've got Tabitha alone, Hannah May alone, it's not, you know, so much of a problem to deal with one girl at a time. I really do think they sort of orchestrated this rift between Tabitha and Hannah May. And I was super glad to see that before Hannah May was murdered, that they did bond on their experiences that were very traumatic and had very similar stories. So Hannah May said, I did everything they told me to, and I'm sorry I never gave you a chance, but they told me you were mean and such. Tabitha said they can trick anyone, but it's all good now. So we jumped to November 15th, and she said at this point she knew Hannah Mae was pregnant with her second child. Tabitha said, LOL, well, at least this time you don't have someone telling you how to take care of your kid. Hannah Mae says true. November 11th, Hannah Mae said, yep, things were different. I have my family together, but it's better this way. And she was talking about, I have my family together. I think she meant at the Wagners. She had Jake, Sophia, and her. And Tabitha said, yep, that's what I tell myself to keep going, is that no, I don't have my family together under one roof, but at least my son won't grow up with a mom and dad fighting all the time. Hannah Mae said, me and Jake didn't fight a lot around Sophie. Angela always took her. The day he choked me, I was beyond done. Tabitha said she would do the same to us, but I think if we moved out, we would still be together. I still love him, really. Do I, I do. I always have and always will, but I hate having to ask to do something with my own son. And the night he wouldn't let me go out by myself to cool off, and then he slapped me. Angela came out and to told George she would get the gun after throwing the board at me. I almost got, got arrested and went to jail. Hannah Mae said this, and it kind of made me wonder. I don't think her and Jake ever were legally married, but she said almost five years and a marriage down the drain. Well, or maybe she's talking about Tabitha and George. I was a little confused, but she said, we still have matching tattoos. And Jake said, he, he still tells me he loves me and is waiting for me to come home. I just don't see it happening. happening. Honestly, I don't want to live like that. Tabitha says, I don't blame you. Hannah Mae said, if they could change 
all their ways of being so controlling and I could actually leave to see my mom and dad without them flipping out, it would be different. Me and Jake have been split up for eight months now and I'm pregnant and it makes me feel like a big whore. Bless her heart. November 15th of 2015, Tabitha says he's still not going to let me see him. Every time I go to see him, he says he has to work on Bernie's truck. Hannah Mae said, so Angel is always there. And Tabitha says, I know. And I asked what the problem was with me being there when she's there. And George said she can't stop doing what she's doing. So F him. I'll take him to court because I'm done with their games. Hannah Mae said, that's what they always say, right? He's working on the truck every time. Tabitha said he waits the day of and says, sorry, Bernie called. I'll call you back. And he doesn't for a week. Hannah Mae said, yeah, just take them to court. Get a good lawyer. Tabitha says, I'm going to have to, but I don't have $1,000. And that's what it takes to just get started. Doesn't include everything else. Hannah Mae said, I know people who would let you borrow it. You know that, right? And I thought that was really kind of read between the lines. I think Hannah Mae really was letting her know that maybe like her dad would help her if she needed it. So Tabitha said, I do miss him very much, and it kills me every day. Hannah Mae said, I can't say I know the exact feeling, but I know I miss Suds when I don't have her. I bet you're glad you get to see your family when you want now, and she puts a smiley face. So we're going to jump from November to February 29th of 2016. Hannah Mae said, yeah, I got Suds ears done today. She loves them, but her dad's mad. She's talking about piercings. Tabitha said, I'd say he is. She's old enough you can tell her to leave them alone. He can get over it. It's not like you're putting a tattoo on her. Hannah Mae said she doesn't bother the earrings. And Tabitha said, I don't see the problem, but I bet Angela's mad too. Hannah Mae said she has me blocked and doesn't talk to me. She says she misses the relationship we have, but she can't stand to get on Facebook and see my profile picture with Sophia and Corey. There was a Facebook page post or actually Hannah Mae's Facebook is still up. It's a, re it's a remembrance page now. Uh, but you can go on there and see that picture she was referring to. I was going to put it on here, but I forgot to blur out uh, Sophia's face. So I didn't want to put it on, on here. So April 14th, 2016, you're looking at just a few days before the murders um, about what? Less than a week, a week, a week and a day. Tabitha said, I was going to see Vine on my birthday, but he went to Granny's, BS, and stayed there until six or so. And during the week, he says he works day and night. On Sundays, they go to Bass Pro and Costco and all of that. Like, whatever he will think, what, whatever he will think, when I give him papers to take him to court and tell him I'm pregnant, I'm not telling him till I hand him the papers. I want to see the look on his face when I tell him Vaughn is going to be a big bubby and he's not the dad. So at this point, both Hannah, um, both Hannah Mae and Tabitha are pregnant by other men. Hannah Mae says, LOL, they don't go to Costco and Bass Pro that much. Tabitha says, he said they go every Sunday as a family trip. Hannah Mae says, Jake still tells me everything. He wants Kylie to be his so bad it's unreal. And she said even if she wasn't his, he still wanted her. He was going to buy me the pastor's house and everything. I was going to go to Alaska for six months and come back, but I didn't. And I told him no thanks on the offer. I'm happy how I am. So Tabitha said that's crazy. I understand his point, but at some point he's going to throw in your face that he's taking care of a kid that you had with another man and it's only going to hurt her and make her feel unwanted and like dirt. And that was a really good point by Tabitha because I'm sure in times of stress and drama, uh, not only would Jake throw that in her face, but Angela and probably the rest of the family as well. Tabitha says you're a lot better off where you are now and you can see in your face that you're happier now. Hannah Mae said, exactly. I love Corey more than I could have ever imagined. He means so much to me. Tabitha said, yeah, and what I read on Facebook, he loves you just the same. Hannah Mae said, he wanted me to move in with him, but I don't want to take things too fast. He accepts Kylie because I got pregnant around the first time we done anything, but I know who Kylie's sperm donor is. It's, it's DNA doesn't mean anything. Tabitha said, yeah, I know my sperm donor is a jerk, but Christian, who I assume is her 
then boyfriend is more than happy. In fact, he's happier than me. And that's massively happy. He's more happy to be the baby's dad and help me raise him or her. Hannah Mae said, Corey's great in every way. He loves Sophia, even though she's a brat. He's raised a baby girl with Down syndrome, and then her mom took her and left him, and he's worried I would do the same thing, but I'm not going to do that to him. So we jump to April 16th. This is just days before the murder in 2016. Um, six days before the murder. Tabitha says, I'm here. George and I are looking for Angela and Vine. They were somewhere called Swap Days in Lucasville. It looks like just a big outdoor venue with tables where people sell things. Hannah Mae said, how's that working out? Tabitha said, couldn't find them, and I left. Hannah Mae said, you know, he probably told her you were coming, and Tabitha said, more than likely. She said George had met her at the gate, and they walked through the aisles to try and find Angela and Vine, but they never did. I pulled it up on Facebook. It's huge. It is at the fairgrounds, and it's those things. You can, you can get lost in them, but still, I mean, if you know somebody's coming, you stay in one location. So April 21st, Tabitha texts, how's that new baby? Hannah Mae said, just laid her down in her crib. She's doing great. Already gained an ounce and a half since I had her. I tell you, I hope when you have your baby, you get to let Vine meet the baby. I went to see Sophia today, and they were so excited. He said she's tiny. I think when she said they were excited, she meant Sophia and Vine, and he said she's tiny. I think she's referring to Vine saying that he was excited about the newborn and she hoped that he would be able to see his own half sister. So the day before the murders, April 21st, Tabitha says, yeah, I hate saying this because he won't let me see Vine, but seeing him at swaps brought back some feelings I don't really know about. He says he only has a few more years. He has to wait to get me back because he had to wait six years the last time. I keep telling him the only possible way we could get back together is if he moved away from Angela and let me have my house to clean it the way I want. And when I want her opinion, never and what I want, her opinion never matter because it would be mine and not hers. But I don't want to go back to him. But then again, I do. I hate being me. Sorry for the novel, LOL. Hannah Mae said, I have my days when I want to go back because that's my whole teenage years with Jake. Something nobody could ever replace. Jake and Billy always ask when I'm coming home, but I don't see that happening. I really want me and Corey to last and grow old. Corey has a house. Jake is never moving from there, but I know Jake hasn't been with anyone since we split up. He says he doesn't have the time and he only wants one person. Tabitha said, I can see him saying that and that being true, but you have to do what's right for you and what makes you happy. Same as I did. Hannah Mae said he wants a DNA test. Yeah, I was shocked when we split up too. It was my call, but I was scared. I had the threat over my shoulders. If I ever tried leaving, nobody would find me. And I saw what happened the night you left. And I know what would have happened if they got you back to the house. Very eerie. This is, you know, 12 hours or so before she and her whole family are brutally murdered. Tabitha said, I can only imagine if George would have let me go outside to cool off. We would probably still be married. I needed five minutes to cry outside alone. I do understand Angela not giving me Vine to hug because he doesn't need bad vibes. I appreciate you taking him upstairs because I wasn't in a good mood. I was trying to clean the kitchen, but Vine was awake. I was trying to get him back to sleep. She pulled up. I saw it wasn't clean. Then George took her side and said he never heard Vine crying. But he was outside working, and Vine didn't cry like he was hurt. It was a little, hey, I'm alone kind of cry. Remember, he was napping. Hannah Mae said, yeah, that night was crazy. Tabitha said, then Angela and George, Angela told George she was going to get the gun. I walked past Jake and hid under the truck, got my bike, go to the gas station, and y'all show up. Angela told the cop, I drug Vine around the house by his legs. Hannah Mae said, I didn't know she said that. I was stressed that night, and nobody slept that night. They thought you and your mom would come there, and they were waiting for it. This was the last conversation she had with Hannah Mae. That was it. 
All right, so we get to Cross, and I'm going to say I, I, I don't like Nash. I don't like the way he questions witnesses. He is not going to win over this jury that is mostly female. I mean, mainly female. And you'll see why in a minute. It's a lot of victim shaming and... Um, Okay, yeah, so we'll just get started. Nash says, you meeting George was set up by Robin Wagner. She said, yes. Jake and your sister were there also. She said, yes. Then he said, it was you and Jake that would be introduced, and George your, and your sister would kind of be introduced due to your ages. And she said, yes. The defense says, you were 11 around this time. Those weekend meetings were two to three weekends in a row. And after three weekends, y'all stayed all night at the Wagner house on Bethel. And she said, yes. He asked, you stayed in Jake's room when you slept over. And she said, Jake's the first couple of nights, but eventually George. The defense said, eventually you just stayed there as a late teen. And she said, yes. The defense said, you were homeschooled before that. And Angela did some of your homeschooling. You stayed at the Wagner home for about a year. This is around this time where she's 11. And so when, when you were asked when you moved in with the Wagners and you said your senior year, yet we're talking about now and you're 11 and you move in. And Tabitha says, well, I didn't change my address. The defense says you ended up moving a dresser into the home, right? And Tabitha said it was a little plastic stand with three drawers in it. The defense says you ended up sleeping in the same bed as George at 11, the age of 11, y'all. And she said, yes, I don't know what the heck was going on in that home. If these women, I mean, like Angela and Billy just didn't care. Did, you know, is this kind of trying to set kids up at 11? I mean, it blew my mind. Uh, the defense said you talked about Angela saying you shouldn't have sex unless you're having a baby. Are you saying that conversation happened when you were 11 or 12? And she said, no, that happened when they were older. So the defense says in 2004, you moved from the Wagner home. And that's because George broke up with you. You attended a church together and he had his eye on another girl. And she said, I guess. The defense says when you were dating George between the ages of 11 and 12, you would leave and come back. We are testimony you weren't allowed to leave. Then you get back together a year later. And, and uh, Tabitha says, no, six years later. The defense says, you didn't move back in. And Tabitha says, we dated for a week or two, week or two after that, and I spent one to two nights there. The defense says, you talk about going to vocational school, and about that time before your senior year, that's when you got back together. You guys took a trip to Florida in July of 2011, and he proposed, and you said yes. And she said yes. Nash said, after you graduated in 2012, you had a graduation party and George came to your house. And when you were together, he would go to your, your mother's house for holidays. And Tabitha said no. And Nash is like, okay, you wed in 2012 and that was your decision to get married because you loved George. You were free to say no. And Tabitha says yes. The defense says you moved back into the Wagner home during your senior year and didn't have a car. So George would take you to school. And she said he would drive me to the bus stop. The defense says, and while you were at school, you had an issue because you were seeing other guys at the school and George found out you guys worked through it and got married. And after the marriage, you were free to leave the Wagner home. She said for a little while. And defense says, I hear testimony on your direct. You weren't free to leave. And she said, I was for a little while. The defense says, after marriage, you were visiting your best friend and you would go to her house a lot to spend the night. And she said, when I was in school. And the defense said, George was okay with that. Nobody said you couldn't go. And she said, they didn't like it, but I did it anyway. This is where I had one problem with Nash because... This really isn't relevant to murder, nor does it justify the way she was controlled. But the defense says, there's a reason you like going to Whitney's for a particular reason, isn't there? And she said, no. And the defense says, who is Whitney's father? And she says, Cecil. And 
Um, sorry, my daughter is texting me from school. Um, Cecil says, how well do you know him? Doesn't he go by Jay? She says, yes. And she said she knew him very well. The defense says at some point you had some revelation to tell George about Jay. What did you mean to tell him? And she said that... Um, I cheated on him. And the defense said on more than one occasion, how much older is Jay? 25, 30 years older and you were 17 or 18, right? And she she said, I was 18 or 19. The defense said, you fe you had very fond feelings for Jay. That There was a reason you had to tell George, well, there's an objection. So the defense says, despite the problems you brought into the marriage, he was willing to work with you, and yet you didn't stop. You continued with this affair. Your son was born July 2015. Do you recall a trip to Cabela's in May of 2013 in Michigan? Do you recall a call from your doctor? And as a result of that conversation, you talked to George about your infidelity. She said that was when he found out. He did not know until that call. The defense said you were having issues about your infidelity until your son was born and George had questions about him being the biological father. And he had concerns about your infidelity and you wanted to work on it and you could have left. It is you and your efforts to continue the relationship. You gave George your phone and passwords to do this. And she said, yeah. Defense says, so why didn't you tell us you gave him these passwords? And she said, He's referring to the text messages with Hannah May, ultimately, that Angela hacked into and read. I think that's where he's going. And she said, well, uh, that was a different Facebook account. When I left, I made a new one. So the defense says, you were given some screenshots of an account you didn't create, but you did create Facebook pages with different names. She said different maiden names. And he said, what about Jane Deere? Is that an account? And she said, yes. Then he really rudely says, I just asked you about that. Did you forget or were you waiting on me to ask you? She said, actually, I forgot about that. The defense said, when you gave birth to Vine, you said your family wasn't there and there wasn't, wasn't there a lot of times. They didn't, they didn't visit you on Bethel. And she said they weren't allowed. The defense said, you said you went home. And she said, as a kid, she was allowed to go home. Defense says, after giving birth to your son, were you satisfied that George was the father? She said, I knew he was. The defense says, there was testing for paternity. She said, yeah, it wasn't my choice. The defense says, your mom didn't like George, so tell me about your mom's idea of bringing another man to the delivery room to have his name put on the birth certificate. Do you recall that? And she said, no. The defense says your mother said that hap that happened or messaged someone on Facebook and you're unaware of that. And she said, yes. The defense says you got the idea George was restricting you from seeing your mom and your sister. You like to go fishing with your mom sometimes. I saw you look up and roll your eyes. Do you know where I'm going with this? Would you like to tell the jury what I'm asking you, uh, what I'm about to ask you? And the objection comes in, of course, because she says he's badgering the witness. And guys, it would look this thing with this older dude. OK, establish the fact that she was unfaithful. I don't care if she's unfaithful seven days a week with somebody else. The controlling nature in which her and Hannah May have acknowledged and the wife eventually that Jake married in Alaska, who I do not think is going to testify from what I've been told, all of their stories line up, and this defense attorney is really trying to victim blame, in my opinion, and change the narrative to the jury that, that she's just somebody who sleeps with everybody. And even if that's the case, it has no relevancy to a family restricting her from leaving the house or not having a phone or a way to communicate unless she asks them to use a phone. No excuse whatsoever. And at any point, George could have kicked her out. So I'm just saying. So 
The defense says you were going fishing and George asked you to go somewhere, but you declined. And during this trip, you had another meeting with Cecil. Is that right? And she said, yes, that wasn't my plan that day. My plan was to go fishing with my mom. The defense says, while you say your mother didn't have a part in it, she was aware and, and enabled you to cheat on George. And she said, no. The defense says, so you're saying your mom was unaware of you and Cecil and she didn't set this up. And Tabitha says, no. The defense says, now this is really where it started getting super inappropriate for me. The defense says, speaking of your mother, you spoke about the unfortunate occasion you were a victim of sexual abuse. And that would have been when you were a very small child, less than 11, before you moved in with the Wagners. Was his name Dave? And she said, yes. The defense says, Dave is your mother's husband. And Tabitha says, well, he's dead now. And the defense says, when did he die? And she said, five or six years ago. The defense says your mom was aware of the things he did to you and your sister. The state gave you some Facebook message with messages with Hannah where you discussed George giving you problems about this when you told him. There was a time. And then he says, Travis Turner. Do you know who Travis Turner is? And there's an objection. Sidebar. The defense says, was there an occasion where you and George met with the rest of your family to discuss Dave and Travis Turner was there? And she said, I'm not sure. The defense says the purpose was to turn Dave into law enforcement for the molestation. But if that happened, your mom would have gotten in trouble and she didn't want anyone to turn in Dave. Is that right? Tabitha says yes. And the defense says George is there for all this. So when you left the Wagner home, that's where you went, was the home with Dave. And George didn't want his little boy living in the home with a child molester. Seems like a rational thing to not want your kid around a child molester. And Tabitha says, yes. So there, I get it. I understand George's position to protect his son 100%. If you've got somebody molesting a kid there or who has molested at least two kids and the mom knew and covered for him, I wouldn't want my kid there either. But, yeah. So the defense says, do you fault George? And she said, no. Your mom was an enabler to these things, if not criminal in part of it. And she said, yes. The defense says George didn't want his child being around Dave or your mom. And you talk about how the Wagners didn't like your family. When George gave the relationship another shot, you guys lived together in the Wagner home. And there was an occasion when George found you in the bathroom and you were cutting your wrist and George was going to take you to the hospital. Tabitha said, that's not what he said he was going to do. And the defense said, didn't George just say you two should just go ahead and go to Alaska? And she said, no. The defense says, you don't recall that? And she says, no, he wanted to send me off to Tennessee to be with my sister. The defense says, did you tell George it wouldn't be good for Vine if we left? He never suggested, and uh, Tabitha said, he never suggested we leave. The defense says, but you went back to the house. And Tabitha said, Angela caught us in the driveway and made us go back in the house. The defense says, you talked about distrust George had with you, and he didn't want you on Facebook. And it's because you admitted you could not be faithful, which is the reason these restrictions were there. And she said, yes. Okay, number one, women don't need to be put on restrictions. I don't care how often she's having an affair. Separate, file for custody, kick her out of your house. But women are not kids that get put on restrictions. And it is very clear to me that Hannah Mae and Tabitha are victims of a cycle of abuse. You can see it when she said she still has feelings for George long after all the bad things happen. It is a cycle of abuse. You have the buildup stage, which is where things start to get bad. You have the blow up phase where it hits the fan. And then you have the honeymoon phase, which is where things are happy and it's a cycle and you thrive in that honeymoon phase. That is the phase that keeps you there with the hope that things will change. So the defense says you agree with me on three or four occasion. You have been visited by BCI agents. Are you aware your conversations were recorded? She said, yes. The defense says there were discussions you had about communication with your mom and you asked George if he could use his cell to call her, but he was at work. And would you agree when George got home, you forgot to call your mom? 
And Tabitha said, he wasn't going to let me call anyways. The defense says, didn't you say you had a wonderful relationship with George? And she said, for the first part, yeah. The defense says, do you remember have a, having a conversation with David Jenking, Jenkins? The conversation with some with, was with an account named Tabby Breach. And she said, yeah, that's me. The defense says, now that I've refreshed your memory, do you recall telling him you had a perfect life with your husband? And she said, yes. Look, uh, if I had a dollar for every time that a woman lied about the state of her marriage to make it seem like things were good, I would be a bajillion heir. It happens. You don't want to air your dirty laundry to people. You don't let people know you're in a bad marriage. So I'm not sure, you know, why he's pointing this out. Women on that jury will get this. They will understand sometimes your life ain't as perfect as you make it on Facebook or Instagram. It's real life away from all that stuff, and it's never perfect. So George, the defense said, George had various jobs. He goes through a list. When he hogged cattle, he would be gone for a week. And Tabitha said, yes. The defense said, back to that situation when you cut your arms. Did you seek help? She said, the reason I did it is because they were on me about getting back on Zoloft. The last time I was on it, it didn't end well. And then the defense asked, why are you prescribed Zoloft? And she names a couple of um, issues that she has. And the defense says, you don't like taking your medication? And she said, no, not that one. The defense says, any others you didn't like to take? How have you been taking your medications lately? And there's an objection. But she answers, yes. The defense says, you discussed the incident with, B with the BCI agent when you left and you told them what happened. Would you agree with me? You told BCI agents you and George were horse playing with the belt. And she said, yes. She said, the defense said, you never mentioned a belt to BCI agents, but you always said it was you two playing around. Maybe I misunderstood you on direct. He wasn't assaulting you with a belt. And she said, no, I didn't say he was assaulting me. The defense says, Angela wanted you guys to stop. Tabitha says, yeah, because I yelled at her precious baby. <laughs> she threw it back in his face a few times. And she's defense says, when you went to leave, George put his arm on the door. And when you left on your bike, it was dark. How much time between when you hid and when you left? She said, it was dark. And the defense says, it was dark. And he tried to stop you from leaving. In other words, trying to, again, justify George. Um, trying to keep her at that property against her will. The defense says, you bit his arm? And she said, yeah. And the defense said, what else? And then she said again, I tried to rip his, his nuggets off. I won't say, but yeah, she used another word. The defense says, at the time, were you still on your meds? And she said, no. The defense said, you said Angela was going to get a gun. Who was around? She said, Angela and George, and Jake was outside fixing his truck. The defense says um, Hannah and Vine were there and you were upset crying and there was a discussion about your state of mind and them not wanting you to hold Vine. And she said, yeah, Angela handed him to Hannah and told them to go upstairs. The defense says, you said George struck you. She said, yeah, before I bit him. And the defense says, oh, you said he hit you before you bit him. Did you tell BCI agents he struck you outside? She said, yes, that's part of what happened that night. The defense says, so you were biting him and hitting him. And Tabitha said, he came out following me when I went outside. I was yelling and he told me to stop yelling. I yelled louder. He slaps me. That's when I said, you just sign your divorce papers. I go inside to get my shoes. And that's what, when he tried to trap me with his arm. The defense says, okay, well, you know, that's illegal. You shouldn't be assaulting and threatening people with a gun. At what point were you going to call the police at the gas station? But then a deputy showed up. You ended up getting charged. You talk about being seated in a cruiser. You went to the sheriff sheriff's office and you were released. And she said, no, I was never sent to the sheriff's office. The defense says you went to the Wagner home and left a note in the mailbox for George. And the content was that Vine could stay with him since you didn't have a place to live. You make it sound like you were the victim. She said, I'm not trying to be a big crybaby, but yes, I was the victim. 
The defense says that summons you signed ordered you to the court. And she said, I don't know. The defense says, do you remember going to the court? And she said, he paid the fine and dropped it. The defense says, let's not go there so fast. You saw a judge. He gets really condescending here with a robe like in here. You went to the courthouse and pled guilty. And she said, no. He said, what happened to that charge? Tabitha said, George dropped it. You can ask him. The defense says, at no time are you saying you never had a court official acknowledge that you had a fine. And she said, other than the domestic violence fine on the charge you dropped, no. The defense says, all you know is it was dropped and you have fine money. For what reason would you have a fine if a case was dismissed? And she said, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Good for you, Tabitha. He said, do you remember going to the courthouse? She said, I went where George dropped me off and paid a fine. And the defense says, were you on any meds at the time? And she said, no. The defense says, so your sister drove you so far and then you met up with George and he took you the rest of the way to the courthouse. You told us you were in a courtroom at the time of the divorce. And she said, yeah, that's where you get divorced is a courtroom. <laughs> George and the defense said, George filed. You have a child in common and you're at the attorney office and you told them you would not have custody and it would be supervised. And she said, yes, that was supposed to be temporary. The defense says, why would you agree to that? And she said, I don't know. I'm not the smartest person in the world. It's really daunting when your ex has an attorney and can afford attorney and you are winging it and you're trusting what George is telling you. So him faulting her for kind of being played about the status of custody at that time and in the future. Um, you know, look, this cross-examination was successful in some ways. He was able to expand on some things that on direct was a little bit more vague. At the same time, I think he went too far with the molestation. I didn't put in here everything, essentially. But then I think uh, kind of the shaming of her being with uh, the older guy and also with her faithfulness, it he was getting her to admit it, and I felt bad for her. Like, you're having to admit, you've opted into recording, you're admitting to the world that you had a problem with fidelity. And it, I don't know, he could have taken that and said, instead of all this stuff, he could have said, you were divorced by your stepfather and your mom did nothing about it. So you can understand why George did not want his son there and leave it there. Now we've gotten into medications. We've gotten into private things. We've gotten into traumas she's endured. All for trying to say that there was a right, essentially, that George was controlling. That's what bothered me. And hopefully it bothered the, gosh, I think there's... Uh, eight, nine, 10 women on this jury. So the defense says at that time, would it have been more convenient if you're with another person that you not have a child in your life? And she got really perplexed and she said, what? He said, you were talking to your mom about being in love with Jay and your mom said you need to make Vine a priority and make, and it's not fair to Vine that you spend the money you save on Jay. She said, you need to get your crap together and forget about Jay. Tabitha said, yeah, that sounds like her. The defense says, so I asked, why would you agree to give him custody? Tabitha said, I had no job, no place to live. The defense said, you said BCI agents came to your home or you told BCI agents that your home wasn't safe because there was a bunch of radio parts. I think it's like CB radio parts around the house. And she said, yeah, it was cluttered. The defense says, and it's where Dave lives. Defense said, you told BCI agents Vine was safer with his dad. And she said, yes. She's not disputing that she acknowledged Vine would be with George full time. She's not disputing that George was wrong in not wanting Vine over there. What she's saying is she got conned. And this... um. So the defense attorney said before the dissolution, you had hoops to jump through. And one of those would be to complete counseling. And she said, yes, defense hands her a piece of paper. And this, of course, on helping children cope with separation. 
And he said, do you recall who took you to that class? And she said, George. So the defense says you were still getting along in spite of things. And she said, for the most part. The defense says, I'm not clear about the agreement. You had to go to a judge before you could divorce. And when you stood in front of that judge, the judge told you that George would be the sole custodian. You would have supervised visits. And there was nothing about changing these things in those documents. Those were your wishes. And she said, no, George said it was temporary. And when I got myself a place, we would go back and get 50-50 custody. The defense says, didn't your mom offer you money for a lawyer? And she said, no. Defense says, if your mother comes in here and testifies, there's an objection. And so the defense says, why didn't you say this in court about how George promised you it would change? And Tabitha says, George said it would take longer to get the divorce if we went that way. Defense says, you were asked, have you been seeing him? And you said, yes. The other question, as much as you'd like, and you said, yes. So in other words, she told the judge at the time of the final divorce that she was seeing her son as much as she wanted. And, you know, here's the thing. Um, it's easy to know that she's not up and up on legal filings and what the inner workings of those filings mean. And when you can't afford a lawyer, unfortunately, there's not many places that have court appointed divorce attorneys that deal with child custody. Some people will do it pro bono, but she was on her own in this case. The defense says you were asked if there's anything you're not satisfied with in the agreement. You said no. To your knowledge, is your mother prescribed any prescriptions? And there is an objection. So he goes back into when her daughter was unresponsive. And he says, was your mom pres prescribed Xanax? And she said, I, I don't know. Defense says, who held your baby when she tested positive for Xanax? And Tabitha says, Angela. Defense says, what time were you at the Wagner's? And she said, around noon. And he said, what time did you bring your baby into the ER? And she said, seven. Defense says, so seven hours later, you take your six-month-old baby in? And she says, yes. Defense said, George had issues with you being unsupervised with your son. There was an incident where there were some peas, the vegetable, and they were very hot. She rolls her eyes because she knows what's coming. They were not very hot. They were warm. Defense says, what did you do? She said, I let him touch the peas to see that they were hot. The defense says, did you shove his hand in there? And she said, no. She, and then the defense says there was an incident with a picnic table. And she said, there was no incident. He fell and I caught him. The defense says you filed something to obtain custody. The BCI agents were there to talk to you about the Wagners. Weren't they the ones who told you to go ahead and file for custody? You said you were waiting on them, meaning BCI, to do something. She said, yes. The defense said, you met with George once and your son was there. And that's when you were told George was going to Alaska. And she said, no, they were going to check it out is what they told me, not move. The defense says, didn't George invite you to come visit him in Alaska and he would pay? And she starts laughing. Didn't he offer to pay for a hotel for you and your baby? And Tabitha said, yeah, but I didn't feel like dying. And um, the defense really didn't have a, a comeback for that. And that was really good. That was a good thing to say. At this point, uh, as we know, the rumor mill was in full force in Pike County that the Wagners were responsible. And I'm sure she probably thought they did it too. Defense says, do you know how the copies of the messages with Hannah Mae were obtained? And she said, I guess BCI. Defense says, do you remember telling BCI agents when Billy was there he was in charge? And she said, yes. Defense says, but you said Angela's always in charge. But there's a difference now. And defense says, you said you couldn't check the mail. Do you remember saying you chose not to go check the mail? And she said, I wasn't allowed to go. Defense says, you didn't get custody until after George was arrested. And she said it was three months later. So, look. Saying she was waiting on BCI agents to do something, look, all that does is save her thousands and thousands of dollars in a situation where, as bad as the Wagners were, the kids were taken care of. They were kept clean and healthy and fed. Um, so I understand the fact that she was waiting on the arrest to happen because she didn't have the money to go 
file and hire and do all this stuff only for BCI to eventually come in and, and arrest the Wagners. So on redirect, there she said, you were asked about freedom of, of movement it got progressively worse. You and Hannah actually referred to it in the messages about you being able to finally see your family. And you were asked about paternity testing and that it wasn't your idea. She said it was actually George and Angela's idea. So the prosecution said, how old were you when you were victimized? And she said it was from the age of nine when until she got with George around 11 or 12. And Angela said, Angela being the prosecutor, he knew the perpetrator was your stepdad, but wouldn't let your sister come over. And she said, that's correct. So the prosecutor said, she gives the court transcript from the divorce and says, George's attorney asks you some questions in the courtroom. You aren't asked at all. You aren't asked all these questions that are in this paperwork. And his, his attorney just asked if you signed everything. And she said, yes. The prosecution points out she did agree to supervise visits and says there's nothing in the agreement that states anything negative about you and why you should have supervised visits. You felt like you had been tricked. You told Hannah Mae you had been tricked, and that was back in 2015, way before any of the homicides occurred. It's a really good point to make, by the way. The prosecutor said when you cut your wrist at Bethel Hill, was that the first or second time? And she said the second. Prosecutor said George wanted to send you to Tennessee. She said, yes. Angela found out and told you to go back in the house. And she said, yes. Who was driving? And she said, George. This was still about the, cuss, the, the cutting. And she said, George wanted to send you to Tennessee. And she said, yes. Prosecutor said, did you get any help at that time? And she said, no. Prosecutor said, you had to ask George's permission to use his phone, right? And she said, yes. You told David Jenkins you had a perfect marriage and you screwed it up. And Tabitha said, I did. Prosecutor said, when talking to Hannah May, you said you were conflicted. You told BCI agents initially the belt incident was playful and then it wasn't. And she said, yes. The prosecutor just reiterates the physical abuse aspect and says, you didn't call the police. And she said, no. So... You, you can't fault, fault her for not calling the police, okay? Most victims don't report. It's unfortunately a lot of times when we find out about this stuff, the victim is in the news. So the prosecutor said, you think to this day George dropped the charges and you were perplexed why you had to pay money if it was dropped. And she said, yeah. Prosecutor said, in Alaska, they have media surrounding them. And she said, yes. I actually tweeted this out yesterday. I'll put a link with some of the pictures of the Wagners in Alaska in the link in the description to, to the pictures. You said Billy was in charge when Billy was around, but you also said Billy was hardly ever around. And she said, yeah, then Angela was always in charge. The prosecutor said, you don't know for sure Angela gave your baby Xanax. And she said, no, I don't. Then the prosecutor points out, you told BCI you left their house at 3.30 and you took her at 6. Of course, there's an objection, but you have to remember, you're looking at years later, 2016. We're in 2022 now. Um, I'm sure none of these people under the circumstances can recall everything they said. And, and figuring out time frames of when you left somebody's house on a day that was traumatic when your daughter's unresponsive, um, you know, I think she could be allowed a little slack in the timing there. And then the prosecutor again says, you felt you were tricked into the agreement about your son. There's an objection. The prosecutor said you were asked about the sexual activities. Angela said you were allowed to do or not to do. Was this before or after the marriage to George? And she said it was after they were married. So we're almost done here. On recross, Tabitha found out the charge was for disorderly conduct. He produced that paperwork and showed her. And that paying the fine was equivalent to pleading guilty to the charge. She said, I believe George when he said the charges have been dropped. Nash said, didn't you have a protection order against you? Meaning George had won a protection order against Tabitha. And she said, yes. The Defense said, and George told you this was dropped? And she said, yes. The defense says, after this dispute, who continued helping you, taking you to court, paying your fines? And again, it's just going back to that. Yeah, well, they were mean and you he abused you, but he helped you. 
that line of questioning, he could have went a totally different way, had more tact about it, been a little more graceful and understanding about things. And honestly, to keep bringing up the sexual affair with the older guy was tacky, in my opinion. You've got a girl on the stand who's been through a lot. The father of her son is, you know, on trial worldwide, and you're bringing up her sexual habits before she even had her kid. Just, and the way he says things, y'all. I, I know defense attorneys have a job, and look, the cross wasn't terrible. He did get some inconsistencies out there, but it's been years. So the prosecutor, last thing, is this the first time she had seen the disorderly conduct papers? And she said, yep, first time I'd ever seen him. She didn't even know she pled guilty to that charge. She never had to go back to court again for that. And that was the end of testimony. She was finished, but it took her the entire day. And she threw it back to him a few times. Here's a picture of her. There were some times I just couldn't get a... Um, screen grab of the laser eyes she gave him i thought you know um tacky 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 i like the other defense attorney crossing better because um you don't victim shame and you don't bring up her past sexual history um maybe once and just say you were unfaithful but then to try and tie that into an excuse as to why she couldn't have a phone couldn't communicate with anybody. It, hey, it's 2022, buddy. That don't work. That don't fly. Women have rights. Women have worth. And no man should hold you hostage or tell you who you can and can't call. So uh, get with the times there, buddy. All right. I'm about to start watching. I'm an hour late. I'm not sure if the witness has even opted in or not, but we are going to find out soon. I'll bring you another episode tonight. So you get a double day of Wagner. We'll see you soon.